On January 28, 1986, only 73 seconds after it lifted off from Canaveral, Florida, the Space Shuttle Challenger exploded. As the world watched on live television, the ensuing fireball plummeted out of the sky and disappeared into the ocean below. The loss of the Challenger and its crew, Francis Dick Scobie, Mike Smith, Judy Resnick, Ellison Onizuka, Ron McNair, Greg Jarvis, and Kristen McAuliffe stunned the nation and became a defining moment for a generation of America. Originally built in 1975 as a test vehicle for the Space Shuttle program, Challenger wouldn't be transformed into an actual spacecraft until 1979. It was first launched in 1983 for the mission that would entail the program's first spacewalk. That wasn't the last first the Challenger would participate in. It was also the shuttle that carried the first female American astronaut, Sally Ride, as well as the first African-American astronaut, Guillaume Blufer. The flight of the Challenger was supposed to be historic because of one of its crew members, 37-year-old Krista McAuliffe. Though she was normally just a social studies teacher from Concord High School in New Hampshire, McAuliffe had been selected by NASA's Teacher in Space program to be the first educator in space. Designed to inspire children and generate publicity for NASA, the plan called for McAuliffe to accompany the Challenger astronauts into orbit and teach a few lessons while they were there. Because of McAuliffe's presence, the launch was heavily covered by the media, and NASA itself provided numerous schools with a raw satellite feed. This meant thousands of schoolchildren, including those from McAuliffe's own class, were watching live when the tragedy occurred. Kristen McAuliffe wasn't meant to be the only passenger on the Challenger who would capture the attention of children. NASA also made efforts to get Sesame Street star Big Bird on the shuttle. They even contacted Carol Spinney, the beloved actor who played the giant yellow Muppet, about participating in the mission. The plan was never approved by Mission Control, but in 2015, NASA did confirm that the conversation of Sesame Street took place. The pilot for the mission, which was called STS-51L by NASA, was Mike Smith. It was to be the first and last spaceflight of his career. Smith also holds the distinction of speaking the last words recorded by any member of the Challenger crew. Just before the explosion, the shuttle's voice recorder captured Smith saying, uh-oh, indicating that at least one crew member knew something was going wrong. Pilot Mike Smith wasn't the only person who knew something wasn't right prior to the explosion. In fact, on the evening before the launch, a group of engineers from a NASA contractor called Morton Thiokol tried to convince their superiors to delay the mission. A meeting was held where the engineers pointed out the launch was scheduled to take place in colder weather than any previous shuttle launch. This was important because the rubber O-rings, which sealed various parts of the shuttle, frequently failed to perform under chilly conditions. Sadly, the engineers were overruled by their managers. One of those engineers, Bob Eberling, returned from the meeting and told his wife, it's going to blow up. Decades later, Eberling would recall that NASA had their minds set on going up and proving to the world they were right and they knew what they were doing. Eberling would retire after the disaster. Decades later, he told the media that his decision to go along with the plans after being overruled haunted him for the rest of his life. The engineers from Morton Thiokol were exactly right in their predictions. The launch proceeded in below freezing temperatures, and when the shuttle lifted off, the O-ring seal on the right rocket booster failed. Heated gas escaped from the rocket and essentially vaporized the material connecting the booster to the shuttle's tank. This created a deadly mixture of liquid oxygen and hydrogen gas. And at 46,000 feet, combination ignited turning the Challenger's fuel tank into a massive fireball. Despite this, the solid fuel strap-on boosters were unaffected and continued to carry the shuttle upward. In the immediate wake of the disaster, it was widely believed that the crew of the shuttle had died instantly. However, the evidence would later suggest a far more disturbing scenario, one which NASA had attempted to obscure. The Miami Herald's Tropic magazine undertook an independent investigation of the accident which revealed that contrary to early reports, the shuttle cabin had not depressurized in the explosion. 
This means that the crew was likely alive and awake for the entire three-mile descent from the sky to the Atlantic Ocean below. January 28th wasn't just the day that the Challenger was supposed to lift off. It was also the date scheduled for President Ronald Reagan's State of the Union address. However, with the disaster only six hours old, the President opted to delay the annual speech and instead personally update the American people on the tragedy. The crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger honored us for the manner in which they lived their lives. This speech would be hailed as one of Reagan's greatest. Quite a testament for a man whose nickname was the Great Communicator. Thank you. The explosion of the Challenger scattered wreckage over a vast swath of the Atlantic Ocean, and salvage crews would spend weeks recovering all of the pieces. In fact, it would take six weeks until naval divers finally located the resting place of the crew cabin, 100 feet beneath the water. The remains of the astronauts were recovered, and those that could be identified returned to their families. Those that couldn't were buried under a monument. Following the disaster, investigators determined that NASA had deliberately violated launch rule. Engineers had warned their superiors that it was too cold for the mission to proceed, and launching in such low temperatures was against NASA's own procedures. Former chief scientist at NASA, named Ken Eliff, later claimed that this failure to observe the rules was the primary cause of the accident. So why did NASA ignore the warnings and press ahead? There were many factors that influenced the launch decision. But the Rogers Commission noted that in an effort to speed launch times to meet NASA's goal of 24 missions a year, the agency had pushed its people and systems beyond their capabilities. This drive to achieve more launches was tied directly to the survival of the space shuttle program. The explosion of the Challenger made headlines throughout the world. Almost immediately, there were calls for the entire space shuttle program to be halted. This suspension would last three years, during which time NASA worked to implement the safety recommendations of a presidential panel called the Rogers Commission. The commission, which included high-profile astronauts like Neil Armstrong and Sally Ride, was formed to help prevent similar disasters from happening again. And it mostly worked. It wouldn't be until 2003 that NASA would experience another tragic incident. That time, it was the Space Shuttle Columbia that burned up during re-entry. 